I2C, so many devices on the bus, such little clarity sometimes with getting them identified. I had several issues with a couple of these devices trying to get them to show up and respond on the I2C bus, and here's how I overcame that. I have an Arduino Uno set up, and I'm using 3.3 volts and ground, and then the serial clock and data, so I'm conveniently using the bus strips going along the length of this breadboard, power and ground down here and clock and data up here, and then all of these I2C-based modules have DuPont cables going for power and ground just sticking on the bus. And just in case any of these devices don't happen to have a pull-up and I only have the one device on, I have a 10K pull-up on clock and data here. And just for working on the bench, even if all of these devices have onboard pull-ups and I've now added this in parallel, it's probably not the best pull-up value, but it'll work. The first problem I had was with this OLED display where on the back of it, it says the address is 78 hex. It certainly wasn't working when I tried to do that. I was using this display in another video, I'll link that below, and a discussion ended up going on in the comments section where a few things were pointed out to me and I learned a bit about it, and then I kept researching and went down a big rabbit hole, so here's what I found. So, thanks to those people, who replied in the comments of the other video and helped sort all this out. Go check out that thread. Here's where all the confusion really started. I found this convenient reference on this Total Phase website. Essentially, there's really only 7-bit or 10-bit addressing on the I2C, but notice they're talking about 8-bit because they are clarifying the issues. Because 8 bits at a time are sent out on the I2C bus, with a 7-bit address, there's the extra available bit, so they use it to tell the slave device if they want to read or write to it. If they are doing 10-bit addressing, well, you can't fit that within an 8-bit byte. So they use a reserved address, and then they put in a couple of bits out of the 10-bit address, and that tells the device, we are using 10-bit address mode, and then the next byte will contain the rest of the 10-bit address. So they split it up that way but we're only dealing with 7 bits, so here's where it gets weird. As they say, some vendors incorrectly give an 8-bit address, which they include the read or write bit. And this was mentioned in the comments on my other video, and gave me a good head start into what my problem was. So here's an example where they might have an actual device whose real address is 49 hex, so it's 1001001, that's 7 bits, but the manufacturer might throw on a read-write bit of either 0 or 1, which in one case you're going to be reading from, in the other case you're going to be writing to, the device with this 7-bit address. So even though it's correct to say you have to send out these 8 bits to either read or write, it's incorrect to say that this is the write address or the read address. The address is those seven most significant bits. The rest is a different function. What mode are you in? On the topic of addressing, in this NXP PDF about the I2C bus specification and a user guide, there's two banks of reserved addresses, the eight upper and the eight lower addresses out of the whole seven bit range are reserved for different purposes, including if you have this right here, 11110, as the most significant five bits of your address, you are telling the slave device you're going to be using a 10-bit address. And then XX is part of that 10-bit address, etc. Things like this. Anything from 00 hex to 07 hex is reserved. Anything from 78 hex to 7F hex is reserved. Your valid addresses are going to be between 08 hex and 77 hex. So going back to this example here, where you have a 7-bit actual slave address, and then it changes whether you add a 0 or a 1 to include that read-write bit, my device told me my hex address is 78. So 78 hex translates to a 7-bit binary number, and it looks like it could make sense because at first I didn't realize this is in the reserved address range. 
anything 7, 8 or greater is reserved. So now that I know a little more about how this all works, if I have a device that's telling me it's supposed to be a certain address and it's not responding, my first guess could be to assume maybe they're incorrectly giving me an 8-bit address with a read-write as the least significant bit. So if I take that away, I would be left with a 6-bit number which, if you add a leading zero, is a 7-bit representation address and it's 3C. It just so happens 3C is what worked on my display. So I know they were adding this extra read-write bit and then telling me it's 7, 8. So it's very misleading and confusing. As a side note, in my research I found this thread about using I2C on Raspberry Pi and somebody had an issue with a 7, 8 address device. They have a sensor where 7, 8 hex is the I2C address and it's just outside the valid addresses which go up to 7, 7 hex so they can't find the sensor. Long story short, someone in the thread says, yeah, it looks like 7, 8 hex in this case isn't something with an extra read-write bit on it that you can actually look at and say, take away the least significant bit and it's a different address. 7, 8 looks like it really is the address for this part and it's in the reserved address space. Oops, by the manufacturer and that they even mention it in the data sheet. This is the data sheet mentioned in that thread. It's some sort of pressure sensor from first sensor. So down on page four of this data sheet, there's this big bold note that says they come pre-configured with a slave address of, well, 7, 8 hex. And then by factory programming, it's possible to define an additional secondary slave address for each individual device. According to I2C bus spec, 127 different addresses are available. The sensor will listen to both slave addresses. So they're acknowledging their understanding, but they're coming pre-configured just outside the valid address range. That's another possibility. If you're trying to use an I2C device in a system that's programmed to only look in the valid address range, you may never even detect your device. So if things aren't working on I2C, there's a number of reasons why, but understanding this sort of fundamental stuff will certainly help, and then maybe you still have to reference the datasheet for the part that you're using. There might be some odd configuration going on. One other thing that might help as a quick reference is, on Adafruit's website, they've been maintaining an informal list of all the I2C addresses of common parts. I2C was invented in 1982 by Philips, which is now NXP, and so they control who gets what addresses. I read somewhere on the interweb about how they don't really publish their list of what devices are assigned to what addresses, but who says we can't make our own list based on what we empirically observe? So on Adafruit's site, there's this list and you can just scroll through. For example, I'm having trouble with my OLED display, right? Well, it just so happens, aha, the SSD 1306 monochrome OLED, that's what I've got. Well, it could be 3C or 3D hex address. There's a good head start. If you have no idea about 7, 8 being totally wrong and it might be an 8-bit address and all of that, come here and try to get a shortcut. Okay, let's try 3C, let's try 3D. Now that we know how to possibly make sense of the address written on a module, or how to use a shortcut to look it up, it would be nice to be able to scan the bus and auto-detect, especially if we're using a custom offset address from the main base address. Because we might have multiple of the same module design on the bus, so we give them slightly different addresses. Well, the trick with auto-detecting what's on the bus relies on the fact that for every byte of info sent out by the master, the slave will do an acknowledge back. We won't analyze it to death, we just need to know that every time we send a byte, we could expect an acknowledge back. So if we're going to initiate contact from the Arduino out to the bus, and we want to scan all the possible I2C addresses, we initiate contact to a specific address, and then we're going to get an acknowledgement if there is something sitting there on that address that can do the acknowledgement. 
if we don't get an acknowledgement after a certain timeout period, either there's no device there, or it's there and it's obstructed from responding, it's broken, something's wrong. So all we got to really do is start at the lower address, try to talk to that address on the I2C bus, wait for an acknowledge. If we get one, there's something there. The wire library is the I2C two-wire communication library, and to use it we initialize the I2C bus with, of course, a begin, and then to use it we would begin a transmission at the 7-bit address that we are interested in, and if we want to write any bytes we set those up with the write command. After we're done, we use end transmission, and it will then send everything out that we put in our buffer. And this will return an error code. And that's where we can tell if something was actually listening and capable of responding on that address. So end transmission will return a value of zero if everything is good and something was there acknowledging. And of course, over in Arduino land, there's several different examples of how to do I2C scanning. So this one's pretty popular, I believe. And then this multi-speed I2C scanner, that's more advanced, and it can detect if devices are able to respond as you increase the speed on the bus. And if they can't, then that means they can't communicate at that rate, or maybe you've got long wires and your signal's compromised, so you can only go so fast. So this would be a more in-depth diagnostic. So I looked at various references and I came up with what I wanted to accomplish, and here's the sketch I ended up with. I decided I'm only going to scan within the valid I2C address ranges, so my lower address is 8 hex and my upper is 7, 7 hex. So I initialize the I2C library and a serial debug window, because that's where I'm going to show the results of the scan. Then in the main loop, repeatedly, I keep scanning the bus and reporting what I find, instead of just doing it once and terminating, because that way in real time I can hot plug things in and out of the bus and get a real time update. Well, I have a 10 second delay, but it'll pick it up on the next scan. So in the serial debug window I just print out a header saying I'm scanning. Number of devices is how many are found on the current scan, so I start at zero, and then I do a loop going from my lower address up to my upper address, and I do a begin transmission at the current address. I check if a zero was returned so that I know I got a response on this address. If it's good, I report that I found it. And then I just do some text formatting when I'm printing it out. For example, if my address is just 9 hex, I just want it to show 0 9 hex. So then it will just keep looping until it's gone through the upper address and it will have printed out the addresses of anything found and then say that we're done and how many devices we found and then wait a bit and start all over. So it is a simple concept and it's hard to be unique when you're basically using the same couple of lines of code which are doing the same thing, calling a function and getting the result. But I figure I wrote enough of this myself and it's all from freely available stuff, so I've referenced where I found it. So let's get it running. I currently have five physical devices on the I2C bus, so let's see what comes up. Okay, so it found seven devices between 08 hex and 77 hex. Seven devices, but I only got five. Okay, well, for now, let's ignore that. 3C is showing up, and that's the display as we could guess from the Adafruit list to help us debug if things make sense. So if I really wanted to know just one specific device's address, of course I wouldn't have all of these on the bus, I would just put the display itself and it would tell me it's 3C. Done. So let's start removing things from the bus. I know this is 3C, so now here's the GPIO expander PCF8574. Well, I already know it's in the 2-something address range because I've dealt with it before. So we have this device here that happens to be 2-1 hex, and I've got this jumper here with address 0 on the 1. So with a base address of 2-0 hex, this makes it 2-1 hex. 
So in real time, let's change it to 20 hex, no base address offset. Now it should turn up as 20, and there it is. So that's this part accounted for. This is the gesture RGB color sensor. What address is it? Well, I really can't remember, but glancing at this, maybe 39 rings a bell. So let's try to cheat and look at Adafruit's list. And yes, 39 hex is the APDS 9960 color proximity sensor accounted for. Well, now we have two things left, but we're getting four addresses responding. Well, okay. This is a real-time clock with a battery backup. And well, there's two chips here. There's the clock itself and then there's a memory device. Those are going to have their own addresses. And looking up the data sheets for the parts or the data sheet for this module will clarify that. So let's just take that out and only deal with this PWM expander. It's PCA9685. So we're getting two addresses, 40 and 70. Well, what's going on? This one only does have one chip. There's nothing else on it. Why are there two addresses? Well, looking it up, someone else had the same question. They get 40 and 70, just like me. And the short answer is, yeah, this chip has its regular address at 40, but then there's an all call address for another function at 70. It addresses all of the PCA 9685 simultaneously. We're not really reviewing this part right now, but just to know, it makes sense. Some single chips might have multiple addresses for different purposes. So there it is. That's how we can use an I2C scanner along with some general learning about how I2C works and what's possible and how things can get all confused and we can sort out our troubles and get on with our projects. Hopefully that's useful to someone out there. You can Google everything and find everything out eventually on your own, but when someone else has already had the struggles, it's good to have it consolidated in one place. Now I gotta go and think of some projects to do with all this stuff.